there are countless myths about the origin of Terminus. Orcs claim the planet was once a ring of titanic mountains, strung together by bridges of water, ice, and magma. Ancient deities fought from each mountain, pushing them together into one mass that has been made smooth by the waters of time. Hieroglyphs of the Gaigana suggest there was one progenitor for all magic, language, and life, who knit the planet together from the fabrics of other worlds. The Tholan recount a lineage of dragon masters that stretches all the way back to the dawn of the planet. They name four flying beasts that each heralded a new season on their wings, yielding autumn, winter, spring, and summer in the wake of their flight across the planet. When compared to the scale of these tales, the story of the seed and the worm may be a book left on the shelf. Its narrative is not so loud or terrific, not at the least upon glance of the cover, and is recounted only by the tree folk known as the Spriggan. While there is evidence in support of the other legends, the seed and the worm lingers on with a peculiar credibility and enduring interest. It is a story with ancient roots that bears fruit to this very day, shortening the travel back into time like a new bloom on the tip of an old tree's branch. Now, on to the telling. In the days before time, Hands reached through the darkness and birthed a new light. This light was called the Seed of Life, and the hands buried the seed in a sphere of soil that hung among the heavens, a womb of ore, mineral, and dust. It was by any other name a planet, one the Spriggan would call Noah, but is more commonly referred to as Terminus. No other race is known to use the namesake Noah, and it does not appear to have been altered through the ages as with Avozul or Nistirok. Out from the seed of life grew limbs of gigantic roots which coursed through the layers of the planet and burst forth on the surface, spreading creation throughout the world. From the roots of the seed came all of nature, seas teeming with life and rivers in kind, mountains and glaciers given their place and form, Orders of beasts and plants birthed and set free to roam. And finally the first tree folk. A lineage of immense creatures meant to guide the flood of creation that whelmed over the planet. These were trusted with the power to sculpt life within the palm of their very own hands. These creatures were known as the Entaniri, though adventurers of today know them commonly as Ent. There are well-known legends of their heart-stopping height, with some reaching as tall as a small mountain and towering above every tree on the globe. Few of these titans still remain on Terminus, with the youngest generations counted among the oldest living creatures on the planet. They are largely passive in nature, save for the outlier, and live as stewards of the most ancient and deep forests, those nurtured on the arcane as much as Ciros the Sun. 
Legend claims that the roots of an ant may be able to reach through the crust of the earth and grasp a tendril of the mothering root that created them. Though the connection may never grow so strong as to invite the attention of the enemy of the seed. Beneath the layers there churned a foe of the seed of life, known as the Great Worm of the Abyss. This monster may perhaps be a draconic kin to the dragons of sea and air, and its devious offspring are sometimes referred to as the dragons of earth or basilisks. These creatures are often limbless, flightless, and in great fury, which may stem from their lot as the bastard branch of dragonkind. While their origins are not clear, apart from their patriarch worm, their lineage carries a consistent theme of rage against the rival Reen and Sol Cromain, if not always a capability to match their power. For basilisks, the crust of the earth is their sky, the hollows of caves their sea. Therefore, excursions onto the face of the planet are rare. Below the surface is their dwelling place, a realm that holds few challengers and even fewer threats. However, the longer basilisks remain in the depths of darkness, the more blind they become, losing the ability to discern light with their own eyes. Hungry for the power the seed of life bestowed upon the world, the Great Worm hunted out the roots that crossed the pockets of darkness that existed between the layers of rock, soil, and ore. Greedily, he ate at the defenseless limbs of the seed, growing in size and strength as a result. Yet of such magnitude were the roots that even the Mammoth Worm required years to sever and consume them. He gave no pause for centuries. And as life spread across the surface of Noah, hundreds of root limbs were being severed beneath it. In time, only dozens remain connected to the surface. Then fewer than ten. Then only one. At the forest of this final great root, the seed of life birthed a new kind of creature. These were smaller and more numerous than the Antarniri, but far more nimble and full of youth. If the Antarniri were the ancient eyes overseeing creation, these younger kin would be the hands and feet that dwelt among it. Their contribution would be in training the tender stalk to break through dry ground, not unlike the matriarch seed herself had done ages before. These new offspring of the seed of life were known as her Spriggan, and it is said they bore the markings of the seed of life, who they call the face in the deep. To them she gave the verdant shards, sacred crystals that hold a portion of the seed's power. Yet no more had the face in the deep instructed the Spriggan on what the verdant shards were, than the great worm devoured the final root, and her presence vanished from their sight. <laughs> 